Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Balance, Getting carb to Carbon Neutrality Through Carbon Sequestration and Offsets. This is a five-part webinar series that runs from April 19th to May 18th. Uh, my name is Garrett Wonk, and I am the Climate Program Manager for the County of Santa Barbara and the Collaborative Manager for the Santa Barbara County Regional Climate Collaborative. Before we get started, I would like to cover some housekeeping rules. This is a webinar, and so everyone who is an attendee is in listen-only mode. Uh, you can always enter in um, questions into the chat or use the Q&A function or raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted, but please remain muted uh, for the time speaking. If you're experiencing any buffering issues or have internet bandwidth issues, we recommend that you turn off your camera. Uh, please hold your questions until the end of speakers' presentations, but we'll all, always be monitoring uh, the chat for any uh, questions or comments that we will try to address. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and kick it off. So the first session of our series is called Carbon Markets, the Basics. And we will be getting into a lot more than just the basics today, but uh, this is going to be the foundational uh, session that will help um, guide the discussion throughout the series. As some of you may know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, recently released the sixth assessment report, and the report offers an urgent message that the time for action is now. The report identifies rapid pathways for needed for cutting global emissions by half before the end of the decade. Also, the California Air Resources Board is also updating its scoping plan to map out the state strategies needed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Carbon neutrality means balancing our sources of emissions with carbon sinks or things that remove carbon from the atmosphere. One thing is clear, achieving carbon neutrality will ultimately require offsetting emissions that we cannot mitigate or reduce otherwise. Whether this is at the scale of an individual project, an entire organization, a whole community, carbon offsets will increasingly become a part of everyone's climate action toolkit. But what are offsets and how do they work? Who creates them? Do they actually reduce emissions? How much do they cost to create or purchase? And how can we support local carbon projects and offsets? We all had these questions too. We are local governments, air pollution control districts, and nonprofits seeking ways to initiate and expand local sequestration projects so that way we can meet local, regional, and global carbon goals. But we are not experts. Over the past two years, we have met as a working group, brainstormed ideas, interviewed practitioners, and ventured grant applications. As we researched and built our knowledge, we decided the next step was to share beyond our group to the larger community. And thus we created this webinar series. At this moment, I would like to pause and thank our webinar organizers. While the series has a bit of a Central Coast flair, we recognize that the universal applicability of what will be shared over the five weeks uh, will benefit everyone. Over the four, the first four sessions of the series will go deep into carbon markets, sequestration and offset projects, and how the resulting GHG benefits are used. Today's session will cover the basic and advanced inner workings of carbon offset markets. Session two will go deeper into the protocols, the market actors and considerations of the supply side of the carbon market. The third session will explore the demand side considerations of, of carbon up markets through the perspectives of a local government, a university, and a project developer consultant. Session four will go beyond carbon markets to explore ways in which land stewards are already caring for the land through regenerative stewardship and how non-market programs can support them. And our final session is designed as an interactive discussion offering an opportunity for series participants to engage in open discussion, debrief their takeaways, and consider the existing and future needs and resources to facilitate local carbon sequestration projects and offsets. This last session is not a webinar like the first four sessions, so it does require a separate registration. 
While this series focuses on carbon offsets and carbon sequestration projects, we recognize that they are not the only solution to meeting carbon neutrality or supporting land stewardship, nor should they be. This series is not an endorsement of any particular solution, approach, or company. It is meant to be a compilation of practitioners who will share their experience and perspectives on this complex topic. We hope this series will increase your awareness and, and the interest in possibilities of facilitating local carbon sequestration and offset projects as a way to improve land management and stimulate economic development. We also want to thank our two, host, two event hosts, the Central Coast Climate Collaborative and the Santa Barbara County Regional Climate Collaborative. Both collaboratives are growing networks for public agencies, nonprofits, businesses, and community-based organizations seeking to collaborate in addressing our region's climate challenges. We invite you to visit and learn more about each collaborative to find ways to engage. And now let's get on to today's program, Carbon Markets, the Basics. Not only are we going to be covering the basics, we are going deep into the offset worlds so that we all can better appreciate the complexities of the market and how best to engage them. I won't spend too much time introducing our speakers uh, because they'll be able to introduce themselves and we really wanna get into the content uh, that they're presenting on. So I'll just introduce our first speaker who is John McDougall from Element Markets, uh, which recently merged with Blue Source. John is the Vice President of Environmental Projects. So welcome, John. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, so um, as Garrett's kind of loading up the, my section of the slides, um, <clears throat> I can just give you a quick background on myself. Uh, I've been working in the carbon markets for just over 10 years now, uh, doing everything from development of offset projects to asset management to the managing the registration, verification, validation, all the way down to the marketing and monetization of the credits. So we'll stream and downstream. And, <clears throat> Um, I'll give a quick overview of our company, um, but uh, my focus has been over the last decade um, to be in both compliance and voluntary markets and specifically within CEQA, working with different uh, CEQA practitioners to, to better educate uh, on the offset markets uh, and to uh, ultimately deliver uh, offsets for uh, offsite mitigation for CEQA. Um, that's obviously one type of demand source in the offset markets, um, but the, I'll go over, you know, overall the overarching kind of demand side, uh, uh, as well as the supply side of offsets in this presentation. So, uh, so the, the general kind of takeaway from this, from this first part is really to give you the basics, as Garrett said, um, of what is an offset, uh, what's the application of an offset, uh, what is the state of the market. Um, and you know what, in the context of you know, what I think the audience is looking for, as far as how it's, it interplays with CEQA and kind of some of the dynamics of the market today, um, I'll go over that. And so it'll be about 15 to 20 minutes to go through. So, Garrett, next slide, please. So just I won't spend too much time on our company, but just as a as a general overview, we are uh, a the largest environmental commodity provider in North America. We recently, as Garrett said, merged with Blue Source. That was an announcement that we gave four year four weeks ago. Uh, that uh, essentially um, you know uh, brought over a, a firm um, that's been in the markets as long as we have that specializes in nature based and regen ag development. Um, as so it complemented our our services and we're really excited about that uh, announcement and merger. Um, outside of carbon, we do a number of other, uh, we're involved in a number of other markets, including RNG, renewable energy certificates, the low carbon fuel standard, which is in California, and the emission credit markets, which are criteria pollutants. <clears throat> um, and, you know, uh, just in general, we, we uh, uh, focused in North America on carbon. Uh, but our portfolio does range across uh, the globe, um, generating credits on, in every continent except Australia and Antarctica. Next slide, Garrett. So this is just a breakdown into carbon. Uh, so just as kind of a quickly, I, I kind of went over this already, but some highlights here is that we've you know, been operating uh, since really 2005, transacted over 135 million tons. And have done that upstream downstream side of offsets, both in the voluntary and compliance markets, which I'll cover here in the next slide. Uh, but we work with a number of types of entities, including corporates, uh, universities, municipalities, 
helping to educate on offsets, how they can complement their decarbonization goals uh, and not replace them, but complement them uh, and, and essentially bring forward a, you know, a, a true verifiable real mitigation measure for uh, decarbonization and environmental social governance. Next slide. So I always like to start with this slide with, with carbon kind of basics. Um, if you're if you've ever been online and you've looked for carbon offsets, it's it's a it's a maze to look through. It is um, it can be difficult to kind of pinpoint, you know, what pricing is and how it transacts and what's the difference between one market versus the other. And the answer is that it is very fragmented. It's balkanized and it, it can be confusing at times. Um, but the one way to think about it in general from a 10,000 foot view is that there are compliance markets and voluntary markets that exist in the world today. In the US, there are two primary compliance markets for, for carbon. That is the one that exists in California under uh, AB 398, previously AB 32 for cap and trade that involves different types of carbon instruments, including carbon offsets or California compliance offsets. And that is an economy wide cap and trade program. There is also a cap and trade program that is uh, uh, power specific in the Northeast that covers Northeastern states for um, power facilities that uh, have uh, at or, or greater 25 megawatts of capacity. Um, so those are the two compliance markets that exist today. I've also listed some ones outside of the US. And, and the really and the takeaway here is if you see on off to the left on the bright on the table here, you have compliance programs and voluntary programs, all priced differently. They all have their their you know different supply and demand fundamentals, different requirements, guardrails. Uh, and so from a commercial standpoint, to be able to understand that and um, what impacts price is important. Uh, fundamentally, though, as I said, at the high level, compliance markets and voluntary markets are fundamentally different uh, in the, on the commercial side, but very similar in generating offsets. And we'll go over that process that really is um, comparable to both compliance offsets and voluntary offsets. One question that I always get when it comes to CEQA is, and on the, on the buyer set, especially on the demand side is, what's the difference between a California compliance offset and a voluntary offset? And there really is fundamentally no difference in generating that offset, other than that the uh, CARB or California Air Resources Board is involved in the uh, final issuance of credits and they're essentially the governing body versus the registries or the voluntary offset registries uh, that also play a role in the compliance markets as far as adding resources to ARB and screening projects up front before ARB's review. But in the voluntary market, again, there's, the, they are the ultimate governing body for the uh, integrity of the program, the offsets, and we'll go over that a little bit in detail later. Next slide. <clears throat> so an offset Again, it is at its basic level is one metric ton of CO2 reduced or uh, a sequester or in another term for that, a popular term today or removed. Um, in terms of regen ag and agricultural reforestation projects, the, the, you know, there are, is a removal element of sequestering CO2 out of the atmosphere versus avoiding emissions, say in different types of projects like a landfill methane capture project or improved forest management project that keys, keeps acreage of forest in place or that carbon stock in place. So the takeaway from the slide really is there can be plenty, many different types of projects that generate offsets that can be registered, uh, but the fundamental unit or denominator is one metric ton of CO2 equivalent. That is the currency. Next slide. So here is <clears throat> on the top side of this slide, uh, is really it kind of follows or segues from what I just said is that you know the the idea behind offset projects is to reduce greenhouse gas gas emissions on a voluntary basis irrespective of its compliance markets or a voluntary market uh, and <clears throat> the greenhouse gases that are listed here as examples can be ones that are avoided or sequestered uh, and then normalized to one metric ton of CO2 equivalent so the top side of the slide is just to say for example a methane molecule that is what would otherwise emitted to atmosphere if a offset project captures that and destroys it they are reducing those emissions by a factor of 25 or another term to use is the global warming potential of that and that just gives you a snapshot of how calculations are done 
that if you're capturing a greenhouse gas, everything again is in currency of one metric ton of CO2 equivalent. More importantly on this slide is the, the bottom. And this is a universal requirements for all offsets, irrespective of project type. These five principles prevail um, on, on all protocols, uh, whether they're compliance or whether they're voluntary. And I'll go over these briefly, but it's important to understand that these are fundamental in every offset project. Real essentially means that there is a, a, the project activity is measured or is in accordance with a scientifically based, publicly reviewed or peer reviewed protocol that is essentially uh, created or adopted by a carbon offset registry. Okay? <clears throat> Additional, very important for offset projects is that it, the project must show, show that it goes above and beyond business as usual from a regulatory standpoint. So it, it can't, uh, the activity for reduction can't be required by any federal, state, or local requirements. In addition to that, you have to demonstrate that the activity goes above and beyond what is business as usual. So they're within embedded in protocols and registries are additionality tests or performance standards to demonstrate from a project proponent standpoint or project developer and offset project standpoint, how your project is going above and beyond business as usual. And you can show that you're overcoming a financial barrier due to your activity by the receipt of carbon revenue or carbon offset revenue. There's common practice barriers that you can demonstrate, but it's important to, to the registry and all stakeholders and whoever's in, involved in the process, whether you're a seller or a buyer, but all offsets that are registered and certified are additional, uh, and there is a process for demonstrating that. Verifiable, all projects must be third party verified uh, and validated. Uh, typically, that's done on an annual basis, but can have exceptions to that. Uh, that's an ANSI accredited or ISO accredited third party verifier that's approved by a registry. Enforceable, this is a little bit different uh, in, certain, in certain definitions, but essentially what this means is that there's undisputed ownership of offsets and that there's clear title of the reductions and the claims. So key word there is reductions. When there is an offset that's created and it's generated, there needs to be clear title from the seller. And then when it's sold to a buyer, they're relinquishing or conveying that title to the buyer and that claim for that reduction. So that seller can no longer claim that reduction and no other third party can either. That is very important and fundamental to all offset projects. There's no double counting. Permanent, so very important uh, in, in, in you know, nature-based, um, you know, not so uh, much of an issue in certain emission reduction activities like destroying methane because the methane molecule can't be reversed back into, uh, you know, methane after it's been converted to CO2. But for instance, in nature-based or region ag, permanence is a question that comes up all the time. And as they're developing protocols on how are you keeping ensuring that this the co2 is staying sequestered in the soil as you move through generations or owners of that acreage or um, you know your 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 transitioning practices what have you it's very important that you establish permanence and that is defined in the existing protocols okay next slide so <clears throat> here is to kind of think about take a step back we just talked about the principles of offsets there's protocols, there's registries. We'll go over to registries in a little bit. But thinking about fundamentally, what is an offset? What does it do for you as a tool? Well, one, it is a complement and a cost-effective option to help meet sustainability targets. It can help shape a goal that you have that uh, maybe you're reducing internally, but you need to meet some some uh, some threshold that's you know for emissions that are unavoidable or residual. You can use offsets as a as a function or a product to to meet those goals. They are fully bankable, they do not expire, meaning that you can hold credits that are issued and they do not expire or, um, uh, you know, they don't have a shelf life until you retire them. And retire is just another word for use them against emissions. So that is a fundamental uh, as, uh, element of, of offsets in that it's a fungible product. You can move it around until it's retired, it can be bought, it can be sold. It has appreciation, depreciation value until you retire it. Okay. And then lastly, here off to the right, you'll see some sustainable development goals. Offsets also have co-benefits associated with that. Uh, and those are, you, you may have read, um, you know, through CEQA and others that co-benefits is important to certain lead agencies and, and audiences there. And that beyond the emission reduction, what economic, social impact does it have? Um, and this is, these are something that we list all the time in our offset projects. And they're also listed for um, on UN sustainable development goals or SDGs. 
always important for a buyer a lot of times is to have those co-benefits associated with it. <clears throat> hey, next slide. So here is, is just going over a very general high level flow diagram of, of an offset um, development process here off to the right. Off to the left is listing some primary carbon offset registries. I've listed the four primaries that exist today that have been doing offsets or registering offsets for many years. Um, those four are American Carbon Registry, Climate Action Reserve, Gold Standard, and Vera. The American Carbon Registry, Climate Action Reserve, and Vera are carbon approved registries, and they do provide the resources to ARB to generate California compliance offsets. But they also have the voluntary offset protocols and the credits that are registered in those programs. But essentially, they have two primary functions. They manage the process for developing protocols by putting forth or creating uh, working groups uh, and different professional scientists on a specific protocol or activity and adopt those protocols and then administer and govern the registration of projects, verification, validation under those protocols. Secondly, they provide the tracking function for credits so that those are where the platform for which credits are delivered or issued, I should say, to start and then transferred and retired and that's an important function of the registry to make sure that there's tracking of credits. So every credit on these registries is serialized, it has a number, and there's no double counting across registries. Off to the right here, this is just a very quick summary of developing a project. You've identified a project activity, you have a protocol that exists that's been adopted. If one doesn't exist ahead of this, you would, you would develop that protocol. You would prepare a listing documents, generate those uh, uh, essentially the, the documents required to list your project on a registry you would undertake your emission reduction activities or your practices that's defined in the protocol you would develop a reporting period that would then you know that was essentially just like a financial audit, audit you're hiring an, a, a, an auditor or verifier as they call it to audit those emission reductions that have already occurred typically and there's exceptions to that in certain programs like climate forward um, but we can talk about that offline if there's any questions around that Registry review after a verifier submitted the report uh, and then they issue findings that then once closed out by the project proponent, uh, then credits are issued uh, and then offsets can be then uh, used in the marketplace. This process can take from beginning to, to end upwards to 18 months with 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 a protocol and even a longer 24 months to um, you know, 36 months without a protocol. Once you've generated your offsets for the first year, it's typically an annual process thereafter. Okay. Next slide. John, before we move on, would you mind giving a uh, kind of a high level example of what like a typical project would look like moving through this process? Yeah, so uh, an example of that would be uh, I can use I'll just use landfill methane capture as an example, but there's many other types of projects. So a landfill project uh, maybe has is, is not voluntary or doesn't have a required system for capturing uh, gas and they uh, um, you know, are not required by any federal, local, or state requirements. They voluntarily install a gas collection system that is capturing gas that would otherwise go into uh, to, uh, atmosphere. There are protocols that exist on these registries that you can register that project with after you've implemented your gas collections or put in your gas collection system and define the reporting period. You then hire a verifier to come on site at that landfill to put eyes on the project to review emission reduction calculations. There's a project design document that you have to submit. They essentially going through and auditing, making sure that permits are up to date, uh, that there are, is no um, you know, out of compliance uh, with not only the protocol, but existing laws and regulations. Uh, and then the verifier that's typically you know, a four to six month process of so desktop review and site visit. And then once they're done with their review and you've closed out findings from them, that they're auditing you against the protocol, then they will uh, issue a verification report to the registry. The registry will then review that report and issue their own fi findings. And then <clears throat> once that's done, credits can be then issued. That's the same for forestry. It's just different type of or ag, regen, regen ag. It's essentially the same concept, but different project activities different definitions of, of reduction activity and additionality and so forth. But that's essentially the process. Next slide. And I just want to be cognizant of time. I think I have about four minutes left. So this is just a snapshot of the registry. 
this is just a sh showing an issuance of credits over time. And this is just the takeaway here is to say, hey, there, there are these registries are serializing numbers. There is a process for tracking and generating these credits. You know, to the left, to the right, you have issued date, you have vintage, which is the year of which the reduction occurred, issued quantity, the reporting period that I talked about that gets verified and audited, uh, and the uh, the serialized numbers off to the right. Okay, next slide. So the next part of this protocol or the of this presentation is really going to start focusing on market. So today, uh, the market has fundamentally changed. It has, uh, with ESG initiatives, environmental social governance, with corporate social responsibility, new goals, with financial institutions moving money over to uh, ESG ratings and requirements for companies to you know, be invested in and customer pressure, you've seen a huge amount of demand come from the market relative to previous years prior to 2016. So we talk about CEQA demand and things like that. That is an element of demand, but there's also this these other uh, demand that's coming from a global perspective and from corporates, municipalities, and universities to meet certain goals. And that's really ESG. And that's part of what's really driving uh, the demand today and offsets for voluntary offsets. Off to the right here, I've listed a few others. Corsia is the airline program. That is an existing, that is an example of a compliance program for airlines that will go on through 2030s that will put millions of tons of demand into the market or requirements for airlines to purchase voluntary offsets. So that's an example of a compliance market required by ICAO, requiring, uh, allowing for voluntary offset markets to be used for compliance, which is important when we talk about CEQA. Um, Paris Agreement, there is an Article 6 in there talking about offsets being used and traded among countries. Uh, and, and you know, really we talk about here off to the bottom, you know, federal legislation. What does that look like? We almost went there, or you could say we almost went there with Waxman and Markey under Obama administration in 2008, 2009. But usually the federal government is the slowest to move on, on carbon and decarbonization. But there is elements of that that is happening, including in the region ag space, uh, where they're looking at ways to potentially create markets and incentives for, for groups. Okay. Next slide. So this, this chart here is to show, again, kind of to, to demonstrate and illustrate what uh, I was talking about over time. If you look at the voluntary offset market over this 10-year period, or really this 15-year period, you would have seen a uh, essentially a very nascent, um, kind of low liquidity market that, uh, you know, through 2015-16. And you had a little bit of an uptick in 2008-2009 with Waxman and Markey and other programs that existed around the world, but that essentially didn't, didn't pan out like everyone had hoped. So you had an oversupply market for some time. And then starting in 2016, you started increasing the demand. So looking at this chart, you have issuances in dark blue and retirements in light blue. Those are both demand indicators. When a credit is issued in many registry, that means there is a buyer receiving transfer of credits. A retirement obviously is your use of a credit, which is a, an obvious demand indicator. But in both of these cases, you can see that almost hyperbolic increase of volume of uh, demand over time. If I were to finish this, this year after 2021, and this goes through August 31st, you're talking about over 300 million tons transacted in the voluntary market, so voluntary specific. For, um, for 2021. And that's essentially, you know, almost tripled the amount of liquidity and also price with that, with that as well, okay? Increased in price then. So next slide. So here's the slide I always like to, to present with, especially with groups in, in, in CEQA. And I'm, I'm gonna go through this within a minute. I'm running out of time here, but essentially the same thing that we, we looked at before, that you have issuances and retirements. What you had happen though in 2016 is you had retirements starting to exceed issuances. In 2021, uh, this is uh, essentially the only year over the last four or five years that issuances did not, were not lower than retirements. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of groups that are starting to, um, to bank credits. <clears throat> Specifically for CEQA, there are, um, uh, you might be, for demand in SQL, there is geographical hierarchy and preference for some lead agencies. So sometimes we talk about a market focused in California. So what does the existing supply in California look like right now? It's for voluntary offset. It is very low. 
The reason for that is because cap and trade offsets make up the majority of offsets that exist in California today. All right, <clears throat> and that creates competition between the voluntary offset markets. Today, we predict about, we've, we forecast around 200,000 tons that are available for transaction today in California alone. So very low supply. There's 400,000 tons of FMUs, that's the Climate Forward Program that are forthcoming. We are forecasting roughly 15 to 20 million tons of CEQA demand in the California market right now, based upon uh, EIRs and discussions and engagement with different developers. That is just what's been put on paper. That is not, and that's over 30 years, I should, I should say. The expectation for what the demand will be in CEQA is much higher as we go through and run through some of the litigation that's happening um, and this market becomes um, more visible and transparent as far as use for CEQA. So the takeaway there really is this, is that it is short supply in California with high demand expectations for California. So I'm way over time. I'm going to stop there. Um, and thank you everyone for um, for listening. John, real quickly, uh, I noticed you're using an acronym that people may not be familiar with. Can you uh, explain what FMU means? Sorry, yeah, so that's a forecasted mitigation unit. And that is a type of credit implemented by one of the registries under the Climate Forward Program. That is a type of credit they call, which, which is ex ante, but basically you get issuance up front and was really created by uh, you know, the CEQA market and for uh, essentially um, you know, creating impact projects for reducing emissions. And so it is a forecasted mitigation unit uh, that again is credits that are issued up front over the term of accrediting period of the project versus the ex post verification that I talked about on a reporting period basis of traditional offsets. Happy, okay, if there's any so questions much, offline, happy to happy to go into specifics there. Yes, we will definitely uh, leave a lot of time for questions uh, as they're starting to roll in. Um, John, are are you open to offering your? Um, oh, here's your your contact info. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and and if I I didn't mention it before, but we'll we'll try to we'll be offering up the recording of this webinar. Um, and to the extent that we're able, we'll also be offering up the, the slide decks that are being offered up today. Um, John, as I'm transitioning over to our next speaker, would you mind, uh, there are some questions that are generally around costs, costs of getting, getting a project started, costs of verification, kind of costs, costs of getting into to market. Could you touch on that briefly? Yeah, sure. So it varies based upon the product type. So a region ag project is going to typically have a little bit higher OPEX costs for the monitoring requirements uh, to hire a verifier to audit that and review emission reduction calculations. Um, but your primary costs for other than actually the capital investment or any actually implementation costs for projects, which are again vary by product type from landfill to forestry to region ag to what have you, on the on the verification or accreditation side. A verification, your primary expenses are going to be the verifier on an annual basis or and the issuance fees associated with registries. The issuance fees range from 15 cents to, to 19 cents per credit. That's how primarily how the registries make their, the nonprofit registries make their revenue. Uh, and then the verifiers are third party auditors. It ranges. It can be, um, you know, as low as you know, ten thousand dollars per per verification to as high as in the hundreds of thousand dollars for large forestry projects. Thank you, John. Another thing to note is, you know, this is just another good segue to the second session of the series, which is uh, focused on the supply side uh, considerations of uh, getting into carbon markets, and we'll hear also from. Uh, someone who's a project developer, and so their primary role is to help facilitate getting carbon offset projects um, initiated and, and into the market through this process. So now, thank you, John. Um, now we're going to pivot to a different part of the discussion of how carbon offsets can play a role with climate action plans, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michael Hendricks, who is the Air Quality and Climate Change Associate with LSA. Michael? Good afternoon. I'm Michael Hendricks, and I am also the chair of the Association of Environmental uh, Professionals Climate Change Committee. And the follow up, the two follow up speakers after me are also uh, members of the Climate Change Committee. So uh, 
uh, great presence to have here. Next slide, please. So climate action plans are a critical um, component of the state getting to carbon neutrality. And the state's overarching goals and, and regulations are critical components to climate action plans achieving carbon neutrality. So it can't be underestimated the important work that climate action plans do and what we're doing collaboratively with the state regionally, as well as local jurisdictions in climate action planning. Next slide, please. Climate action plans uh, use carbon offsets for three basic purposes. One is local jurisdictions that uh, these climate action plans cover cannot reduce GHG emissions down to net carbon neutrality on their own. They need some help. And, and that help is in providing some, some sinks or offsets through the carbon market. Carbon offsets are also useful as interim ways of reducing sector specific emissions until technology catches up. So uh, the use of natural gas is one place where essential land uses that are essential to the use of natural gas need to somehow offset those emissions. And then carbon offsets are also useful for new development projects within a climate action plan that want to achieve zero emission goals. They're gonna need to do that with carbon offsets. Next slide, please. So there's two types of what we call offsets, the formal offsets that John just went through, and then a more informal, often people call them offsets, uh, but they would be implementing community level reductions uh, off site of a project, but within a climate action plan. So these two types of um, carbon offsets are typical in a climate action plan. And I'll go through some examples of both types. We'll start with the offsite community level reductions. Next slide. So, offsite community level reduction measures do not have the same administrative rigor as carbon credits in the voluntary market. All of those checks and balances and verification that John talked about, none are actually required within a climate action plan. It is up to the local jurisdiction, how they administer it. Uh, local jurisdictions do track uh, their reduction measures within a climate action plan that's required of CEQA, but not to the rigor that the uh, carbon market does. And oddly enough, the courts support community level reduction measures. Whereas they've been skeptical, very skeptical, and Brian and uh, Rich will, will kind of highlight that of uh, the use of carbon credits, the use of offsite community reduction measures within a climate action plan is widely embraced by the courts. So I find that a little ironic. Next slide, please. So one, that there are basically two types that typically show up in a climate action plan. One is a community level electric vehicle infrastructure implementation plan. So this community level electric vehicle infrastructure implementation plan really focuses in on electrifying the fleet within a, a local jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Uh, these plans will evaluate the existing land uses within the city, county, or region that is within the sphere of the climate action plan that require electric vehicles charging stations to better serve the electric vehicles within that community. And they will look at those land uses, these existing land uses. There's not a lot of hooks that they can require these land uses to provide electric vehicle charging, but uh, there certainly is a need for it. They'll generally have GIS uh, mapping of the locations where they'd like to target for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. And obviously the implementation requires funding. And because of that, um, new development projects are sometimes looked at as a way of getting that funding. So they 
uh, the Climate Action Plan may require new development, particularly if it has a large emission profile, to offset some of its emissions off-site after it's done everything that it can on-site and uh, provide the funding to, to actually build these uh, uh, charging stations at the location. And then it's up to the jurisdiction itself to uh, track where they've been put and, and triage which ones are, are most in need. Uh, one other thing I'd say about uh, an example of an electric vehicle infrastructure plan, um, South Bay Cities Council of Governments in their regional uh, climate action plan had an electric vehicle infrastructure plan for El Segundo and Carson and a few other environmental justice communities where they not only had the chargers, but they had on loan electric vehicles, small electric vehicles that were locked into these chargers and uh, residents of these neighborhoods could actually, through an app, unlock those and borrow the car, if you will, and uh, put it back on the charger when it's done. So that, that was one way that, uh, uh, a Southern California regional COG had uh, implemented a re community wide reduction measure that actually uh, benefited an uh, environmental justice community in a way. Next slide, please. So, another common um, community wide effort within a climate action plan is an urban forestry plan. It evaluates the existing tree canopy when, within the city and where there's need for more trees. And this gets very complex because in addition to having the tree canopy to provide shade, uh, reduce uh, the urban he heat island effect and sequester carbon, they also need, need to be mindful of not shading solar panels providing line of sight on the streets and street signage and traffic lights, that kind of thing. These are also GIS mapped, uh, looking at where the best places are to uh, plant additional trees. Implementation and maintenance also requires funding. So this is another opportunity that new development projects may be required to do some offsite mitigation by putting in the, um, irrigation infrastructure and the trees that are needed to uh, fulfill the urban forestry plan. Now, this picture of this one neighborhood is what we'd all like to see all the residential neighborhoods looking like. But if you go to the next slide, we have a, a picture of a more urban area and low income. So you can see the challenges there are to have actually having an urban forestry plan work well within the city throughout the city. So low income communities tend to lack tree canopies. And this is a good example of that. Uh, the co-benefits of tree canopies are as important or more important often to the jurisdiction than the carbon sequestration itself. Often the urban forestry plan, when you take into account the, the energy needed to uh, provide the irrigation water and, and maintenance for for the urban forest canopy, the sequestration portion of it is pretty much a wash. But there's additional benefits as far as uh, reducing the heat island effect, improving the air quality of areas, uh, improving the mental health of, of just wanting to be in these communities that are, are very important to local jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So I just talked about two examples of uh, what we call offsite reduction uh, measures. Climate action plans also use carbon credits within the voluntary markets to ensure that the cap achieves the, its goals. And some of those are sector uh, specific offsets meant to offset a particular sector that they cannot reduce on their own. And the other is the general use of offsets to ensure that the cap reduction targets are met. Next slide, please. So a sec couple of examples of a sector specific carbon offset is uh, biogas credits, um, methane capture credits, uh, the uh, what 
John talked about as far as renewable uh, natural gas credits that can be used to offset the use of natural gas in certain industrial processes. Now, industrial processes, if they're large enough, are captured under the cap and trade program, but there are a myriad of small kilns and furnaces that are in use for industrial or commercial processes such as ceramic kilns, dental offices, uh, laboratories that use natural gas and need to use natural gas and need to offset that somehow. Another place that we're recently seeing, particularly in um, Southern California and what they call the Inland Empire is the need to offset supply chain logistics. Supply chain logistics, basically heavy duty diesel trucks going from the port of LA, port of Long Beach to points east. And we are finding in some climate action plans uh, requiring logistic warehousing to have interim offsets until an electric truck fleet is ready to roll. And what they do there is they will provide the conduit, uh, the wiring and the capacity for the chargers for the trucks, but then on a yearly basis offset the emissions until that truck fleet is actually on the road and uh, delivering product either to the port or taking a product from the port. Next slide. And I believe this is my closing slide. I went through this really fast to kind of catch up. Um, it is vitally important that uh, we achieve carbon neutrality. And to do that, we are gonna need offsets of different types. Climate action plans are, are one means of doing that. And certainly at a project level, um, Brian and uh, Rich will get into the details there. But uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you guys. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we are gonna keep moving along so that we were able to get uh, all the presentations in and still leave time for uh, questions. Um, we're going to be pivoting now back to uh, the issues around uh, offsite credits as CEQA mitigation. And with that, I'm going to be turning it over to Brian Schuster. He is the Senior Managing Associate at ESA. And um, Brian, if you just, Give me a moment to look at the slide deck up, but you can go ahead and uh, start off with an introduction. Thanks, Garrett. And uh, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for sharing your afternoon with us. Really appreciate everybody um, joining today. Uh, as Garrett mentioned, I'm Brian Schuster with ESA. I specialize in air quality and climate change. Um, I help manage ESA's climate action planning practice and serve as technical director for air quality and greenhouse gas analyses under CEQA. Um, just quickly about ESA, we're a 100% employee owned firm. We've been around for 50 years. Um, CEQA is our bread and butter. We do all kinds of other things like uh, planning, design, restoration, et cetera. Uh, so I'll jump into it. I'm going to just do just share a couple of slides on the use of offset credits as CEQA mitigation. And then Rich Walter will follow um, talking more about CEQA, uh, case law, um, pitfalls, pros and cons, all that stuff. So. Uh, next slide. First question, can GHG offset credits be used as CEQA mitigation? The answer is yes, but there are plenty of caveats, of course, as there always are. Um, just a couple of uh, notes here to the CEQA guidelines. Um, this one, 15126, is pretty clear. Offset measures, including offsets that are not otherwise required, can be used to mitigate a project's GHG emissions. Um, of course, it's more complex than that, as Rich will go into with some of the uh, case law that we've encountered over the last couple of years, but uh, the idea of an offset is valid under CEQA, um, provided that the mitigation measure you know, meets all of CEQA's requirements for mitigation. Um, AB 900 is a judicial streamlining um, bill uh, under CEQA, which requires projects to achieve no net additional GHG emissions, essentially net zero. These are CARB um, verified, basically not verified, but CARB approved applications to achieve this net zero. And every single AB 900 project approved by CARB up to date has required the use of offset credits to meet that standard. Um, so CARB is supportive of the use of offset credits under CEQA, but again, there are plenty of things you gotta do if you're gonna use it as a mitigation measure. Um, 
And then final natural uh, resources agency, their uh, final statement of reasons on the CEQA guidelines in, in 2009 uh, also support the use of, of credits in CEQA. So just a bit of foundation there. Next slide. When can we use offset credits in CEQA? Uh, basically, after you do everything on site, that's the recommendation. Mitigate project design, reduce your emissions to the maximum extent feasible given technology, financing, project objectives, et cetera. Um, and only after all feasible on-site local emission reduction measures are incorporated should you consider offsets. Um, this isn't a rule, it's a strong recommendation. Uh, it, it is in, in CEQA guidelines as well, recommend, you know, sort of identifying that. Um, you need to quantify your project's emissions and then reduce on-site to the maximum extent that you can, EV charging, all electric buildings, renewable electricity, et cetera. Um, and then finally, if additional reductions are needed uh, to get to your significance threshold, whatever that may be, offsets can be used to close that gap. Next slide. What's the level of detail that's an offset mitigation measure needs to, to, to meet under CEQA? Well, more and more as the days go by, every new court case, we're adding paragraphs to our offset mitigation measures. Uh, but at the very basic level, um, we need some sort of quantification, how many offset credits are needed, uh, are, what assumptions are we using to calculate the, the gap to the offsets? Um, do we need to reassess annually or every couple of years, the project's emissions to calculate that residual amount to get to your threshold or your performance standard for the project that needs that piece. There's an agreement, you know, a contract essentially between the applicant, lead agency, the registry, CARB, you know, whoever's involved with um, conducting the offset project, uh, the voluntary registry, any additional third parties that may be involved, you know, it's, it's, it's some lead agencies like to hire their own expert um, outside of a registry to basically double up on third party verification. So contracting is really important, binding agreements. Um, uh, thirdly, confirmation and validation. So what kind of standards are applied? What registries are allowed? What locations are preferred? Um, what are the credentials of the, of the uh, verifiers? All of the, the nuts and bolts of the objective performance criteria for offsets. A lot of that's contained within the, the protocols the registry protocols. Um, so your mitigation measure needs to talk about those. And then finally, reporting and monitoring. It's just like any mitigation monitoring plan. Um, is the mitigation measure being effective? Um, have we purchased enough and retired enough offsets? Do we need to buy more? Can we bank some from a previous year? Uh, do we need to true up the project as vehicles get cleaner, electricity gets cleaner, maybe new technologies come online and we don't need as many offsets? annual reporting and uh, to ensure that that your performance goals and your offsets and your other mitigation measures are working is really important. Next slide. Just a couple more slides. Um, so you should use GHG offsets as mitigation. Um, of course, and like any mitigation, it's it really is up to the lead agency to discern to determine the effectiveness of a mitigation measure based on substantial evidence. And I think um, although there's lots of skepticism around offsets and uncertainty for certain protocols, I mean, we're not glazing over that and we'll get to some of the questions that I've seen pop up in the chat regarding those, those issues. Um, the, you know, the, the registries are, are very robust. Um, offsets are things that have occurred in the past. There, some protocols do have risk of reversal and permanence issues, but generally, um, generally that's not as big of a concern as most people, uh, as most people may think. But of course, there are issues and they're not perfect, just like any mitigation measure. Um, other reasons you should use offsets, it supports an aggressive threshold of significance. If you're not sure what threshold to pick, if your air district hasn't adopted a GHG threshold or your lead agency doesn't know what to do, like what's, what's significant, what's not, well, you can choose zero, which is a pretty clear level of lesson or even no impact, and offsets can help you get there. Um, it encourages projects to be very low GHG. Um, offsets can be cost-effective and feasible. The, you know, the, the, the 
prices vary, as John mentioned, and they're likely to change in the future. But generally speaking, offsets are cost effective way of reducing one ton of, of CO2E. Um, and they're widely available, at least in the US and North America, and of course, internationally. Um, California, the, the market is very limited, as John mentioned, but, but nationally and, and, and continentally, um, there's lots of availability. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a, an example here, uh, this is the Oakland A's Ballpark, a mis mixed use project, the new West Oakland um, A's Ballpark um, land use development. Uh, the EIR was just certified by the uh, uh, Board of Directors a few months ago. Um, this project is a net zero project. Uh, the, the special legislation that passed for this project, AB 734, required not only that the project achieve net zero emissions, but also that at least 50% of the reductions have to be local. That's either on-site or neighborhood measures. Because West Oakland is a highly burdened community from toxic air pollution, you got the port, you have multiple freeways, you have ocean going vessels, you have rail, lots of heavy duty trucks. Um, as, many local offset, as many local programs as possible to achieve that 50% standard have to be implemented. And then the remainder um, can be achieved through offsets. And that's written into the, EI, the final EIR for this project, those offsets, along with the on-site. Next slide. Last slide. You should not use CEQA off, GHG offsets as CEQA mitigation. Uh, on the flip side of the coin, this is a very delicate balance, and Rich is going to get into more of this. But offsets as a mitigation measure need to be very detailed, very specific, very objective. Um, there need to be specific performance criteria for offsets, timing, contracts, all those things I mentioned before. There are environmental justice concerns, of course, including the local co-benefits. If your offset is not local, the community is not going to see those benefits. Um, that's not a GHG impact issue, but it is a public health issue. It's a policy issue. It's an environmental justice issue. These are really important issues um, and, ca and can't be ignored. They, you know, they go hand in hand with GHG reduction. So this is one concern and a valid concern that a lot of people raise. Um, local offsets are scarce and can be expensive. So if that's your priority, then it may not be possible to mitigate locally. There is some risk of reversal on the forestry side, and I won't go into detail because I'm not an expert on these things, but the offset registries do have buffer pools and other um, backstops to cover any reversals. But you know, there are some valid concerns as far as permanence go for certain offset project. Others like landfill methane capture, um, there, it's not as much of a concern. Um, enforcement authority, of course, beyond the lead agency, going to a registry, going to a third party verifier, lots of people involved who are doing various things. Um, so making sure you identify those folks and um, all of the criteria for involving them are spelled out in your mitigation measure. And then finally, there is some legal risk of deferral, feasibility issues and enforcement. Offsets have to meet the feasibility and other uh, criteria of CEQA. Um, so you can't just say we're going to offset and be done with it. Um, you have to really go through the motions of complying with all the CEQA requirements for mitigation. And um, that's the end of my presentation. And Rich will take this to the next step. So thank you. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And um, thank you for catching us up a little bit. And I will quickly transition over to um, to Rich Walter um, from ICF. Rich is the Vice President of Environmental Planning. And Rich, again, as I'm uh, queuing up your slide, feel free to go ahead and kick it off uh, with your introduction. Great. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to go uh, quickly through a number of the challenges, but also um, some opportunities that I see for uh, offset providers um, Central Coast or elsewhere. Uh, so one of the reasons you have heard us talking about CEQA, uh, a number of them, is that the demand for, CEQA, for offsets isn't only from people who are going to get an approval uh, for a new development and have to go through the CEQA process, but also uh, corporate uh, sustainability efforts and, and other efforts that are out there, climate action plans. Uh, and so on, but it is a potentially large and growing market because the demands to mitigate under CEQA are getting tougher and tougher. And that's one of the reasons we talk about it a bit. You, you know, if you're interested in 
in doing an offset uh, program that you know compliance with CEQA may not, uh, except for your own project, may not be the biggest, but it is an important driver in California of um, of potential demand for offsets, which creates a market which is really important to the viability. So diving in, next slide. You may have heard um, that uh, there have been some court rulings, and you may have heard them characterized as being against uh, the use of offsets, particularly under um, CEQA. And usually what people are referring to is something called the Golden Door II ruling. The Golden Door is a very expensive spa in northern San Diego County. It's had a lot of fights um, from them to stop development that's next door. And in the process, they have uh, filed numerous lawsuits against the county including on the potential to use uh, greenhouse gas offsets or credits as mitigation. So some of the things that the court said are listed here, won't go into them too much, but they were criticizing it, that the mitigation uh, was not equivalent to the cap and trade system, uh, didn't necessarily require CARB approved protocols, had no constraint on using uh, greenhouse gas credits from outside of California or perhaps internationally, uh, didn't have an express additionality requirement and delegated some critical decisions to the planning director who may not necessarily be qualified uh, to make some decisions about the adequacy of offsets. Um, in my opinion, some of the things that they, they criticized about the mitigation were appropriate. Uh, some of them were flagrantly wrong <laughs> in, 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 uh, in judgment and in science. Uh, but the reaction of the market to this is, is to make better mitigation that pretty much addresses every one of the issues in it. Um, next slide. And though the court criticized the use of, of it, um, they actually went out of their way to say, to be abundantly clear, this decision is not intended to be uh, a blanket prohibition on using carbon offsets, even those outside of California, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions under CEQA. So the ruling did not preclude um, the use of it. It, it. I would say it made us tighten up our belts and to make sure that we have really rigorous uh, mitigation language that really matches the professional practice of offset um, protocols and, and offset practice to make sure this is real mitigation. So um, there's also uh, the Association of Environmental Professionals has published on this. Uh, and, and spoken on this, and, and we're hoping that we can keep, keep this as a potential tool for CEQA compliance, which would also increase the market uh, demand uh, for offsets in California and elsewhere. Next slide. So some of this Brian has said before is that um, it's actually, they, they are allowed by CEQA, it's not been eliminated. Uh, some recommendations just to reinforce some of the things that, that Brian had said. Definitely use you know um, proper, well-developed, lo long experience registries and, and protocols. Uh, you can reference some of the objective criteria for determining validity. These are the things like real and additional and permanent uh, that are used commonly in protocols. Make sure and reference those. Have performance standards. Um, discuss whether you have a locational priority or not. <clears throat> Most places, when they're requiring these under CEQA, they're saying, okay, look local first and then look in the county and then look in the region and then look in the state and then only then and only then maybe look outside the state and, and, and if outside the country, uh, look, you know, then look internationally. Um, make sure that there's decision-making by individuals with expertise. So there are people who are accredited and trained in doing this um, who may not be the planning director, but most likely will not be. Um, there, there is going to be some continued controversy about their use in CEQA, so I wouldn't say that's resolved, even though I think we have good answers for that in practice. And critically, there is a very important social issue um, that, that does derive about it, and that's really uh, focused on environmental justice. Next slide. So there's been a, a long um, debate. I'll get into the environmental justice in a moment, but uh, just following up a little bit, the biggest debate uh, in the environmental justice world relative to greenhouse gas offsets is where do they occur? And there's a lot of criticism that they don't necessarily occur in the place where the emissions occur. Does that matter as far as global warming? Not really. It's a well-distributed gas in the atmosphere um, and, and it affects the global uh, climate. Um, so you can mitigate in a different location 
when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions from the location where the greenhouse gases are emitted. Uh, so as far as greenhouse gases is concerned, location doesn't really matter. Um, however, you can express priorities. Uh, you know, local governments can certainly use priorities to, to express their policy differences. And there are some fineries about the statewide targets, but um, as long as the credits are additional, they're still helping the state to reduce its emissions, even if sometimes that might be outside the state. Next slide, please. But as a social and policy matter, uh, this has been a concern about the uh, statewide, the cap and trade program, which is only for regulated entities, you know, um, large fuel providers and industrial um, sources, power plants, things like that. The big concern there is not so much the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the CO2, for example, that might be emitted locally, but when you emit CO2 at a power plant, you're also emitting other air pollutants that have a more localized regional effect, not just the global effect that you might have from CO2. So the concern has been when you approve a project and you allow it to mitigate the greenhouse gas somewhere else, you don't get the co-benefits locally. So if you, in, in uh, the advocate's uh, point of view, if you had to lower uh, the, all the emissions locally, including the greenhouse gas emissions, then you would likely be reducing ozone precursors or particulates or other things that do affect local health. So it's a very much a policy issue. Uh, it hasn't quite gotten to be a CEQA issue yet, um, but it, it may in the future um, get there. So this is an important issue uh, for local governments uh, to some extent, the state government to continue to act on. Outside of CEQA, perfectly fair. You know, a lot of uh, general plans are including an environmental justice element now. So this may be uh, something that they want to consider in there. Um, and you saw the example from uh, Brian's uh, project with the Oakland A's, where they were prioritizing what 50% uh, to bring that local to kind of balance between the flexibility that offsets can provide, but also having some sensitivity to those local issues. Next slide. And there is a law uh, in pending in the legislature right now um, that has to do with uh, two different aspects, but they're somewhat related. And one, I won't go through it all. This is called AB 1001. And one is uh, prioritizing local mitigation of air quality effects. And the second is to actually bring in environmental justice into uh, the practice of CEQA. So this would change things uh, pretty substantial. There is a relation to these issues of offset credits. I would also plug that there is a AEP Institute focused on environmental justice and greenhouse gas offset credits uh, that's coming up in June. Um, that, and it's gonna do a whole day just on that issue to focus in on it. Next slide. So those are a couple of challenges and I wanna finish out with uh, some of the drivers uh, for the demand. And uh, John McDougall gave it his estimate of uh, you know, where, the, where the demand is right now in CEQA. And this was kind of a, th a think piece that I did just looking out to 2030 and 2045 if all projects were, uh, that, that all new development were subject to greenhouse gas reduction requirements. And uh, it shows, and, and these are also 30 year lifetimes. So this isn't necessarily each year per se, but it's a total out to 2030 or 2045 of the potential market, which is in the hundreds of millions uh, of tons up to very high hundreds of millions, um, depending on it. The actual demand is probably much lower than these numbers. It just shows you the theoretical amount of demand should this become common in CEQA is quite large. Next slide. Uh, the other is Senate Bill 27, which was just passed last year. Uh, the, the state is going to establish a carbon sequestration and climate resiliency project registry. Uh, this would provide an opportunity for project um, proponents who have offset projects uh, that involve sequestration on natural working lands, which is a big focus of, of the seminar series, um, that they could list that up there to publicize it, to um, uh, seek funding uh, from either the state or private entities for their project. And they have a series of criteria uh, that they are looking to um, uh, vet uh, proposals. And if they pass all that criteria, then they'll put it up on the registry uh, that the state is establishing by next year. Next slide. And then finally, um, the, um, this is the, uh, some of the math behind the scoping plan. The scoping plan is the state's 
strategy for uh, moving greenhouse gas reductions forward. And they're looking uh, right now in the new scoping plan that will be coming out soon uh, about strategies to get to carbon neutrality or near to carbon neutrality by 2045. And uh, what this slide shows is that if you look on the right uh, in the graph uh, at the 2045 bars, you'll see a number of things above the line. These are the residual emissions under different scenarios, you know, that they're finding that pragmatically, uh, we're probably not gonna eliminate all emissions. Uh, and they're looking at a range of different, you know, severities in terms of how they implement reductions overall, but they're still gonna have, you know, 100 to 200 million remaining, depending on uh, scenario, uh, uh, metric tons at the state level. And then that below the line on 2045, kind of the gray hatched is carbon dioxide removal that would either come through carbon sequestration on natural and working lands or through direct air, direct air capture, which is sort of a new technology that's coming out. So those are that, this is another driver is that if the state is saying that we're, we're not gonna be able to eliminate all emissions, we can get them way, way down, but, but to get to carbon neutrality, we're gonna have to invest heavily in carbon sequestration and perhaps some of these new uh, mechanical removal technologies, that is also a market driver uh, for project proponents that might be looking at um, to do sequestration in their ranching or, or their farming uh, or other natural land uh, investments. Next slide. I think that's mine. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rich. And thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, we definitely have a number of questions coming in from the audience. So we'll try and get to a significant amount of them. Um, but ones that we don't get to through uh, today's session, we'll do our best to follow up with written responses that we'll also be able to share um, following this, following this, uh, this series. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw, start out with a, with a heavy one. Um, so in the beginning, we got a, a comment calling out the, a recent study from UC Berkeley that found that uh, a significant number of offset credits issued by ARB under the forest projects offset protocol shows that over 80% of those credits generated by these projects likely do not represent the true emission reductions. Um, and there was another comment uh, from another participant, uh, again, kind of touching on uh, you know, bogus carbon credits um, or lack of additionality. Um, so wanted to put that out there and see who wants to take that one first. I'll jump in on that one. Um, fam familiar with the study and familiar with the, the authors there. Um, you know, what I would say about that is that, uh, you know, the offset protocols, um, I think, if you look at the responses from ARB, if you look at the responses from the registries, they very concretely and objectively addressed those uh, concerns with uh, the way that they, uh, the monitoring plan is set up in the protocols for forestry, uh, the way that additionality is demonstrated, the requirements for putting conservation easements in place and giving up harvest rights. Uh, so what I would say to that is where, where um, there was an argument for that from, from Berkeley, I think that if you dig a little deeper, it's not that clean cut. Uh, it is it, it is very difficult and challenging to generate an offset offsets from a forestry project. They have to go through very rigorous standards, um, and there is uh, defense in in um, in the additionality and permits of offsets for forestry. Happy to elaborate on that. Well, I, the only thing I would add is that the um, good to read the Berkeley study, you know, and good to read the response to it that, that CARB has provided. They're all they're both available on the web. And that'll really get you into. You'll you'll fast find that that the details really matter, not the, not necessarily the top line uh, headline, but when you go into that, it is uh, it's a matter of choices that are made in in developing a protocol, in applying it, in the monitoring, as as John said. But uh, it is a complex world, the protocol world. Um, but I find that most times when I uh, and and there have been, you know, the 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 greenhouse gas market. Offset market started in the 90s, nominally speaking. Uh, maybe John knows that it started earlier, um, given his knowledge. But there, there have been problems uh, internationally, um, not everywhere internationally, but in certain types of protocols that have been used. So there, it's, it's not to say that there aren't challenges in coming up with good protocols and doing it over time. But um, I find that 
when I go into some of the critics uh, uh, claims about that, it is much more complex um, in, in terms of the details. And so I would just encourage people to look at them. And one last thing I'd add is uh, don't just go by the news articles, look at the uh, papers themselves and, and the responses because the news likes to make headlines. And I think that, <laughs> that creates a little bit of misunderstanding, if you will. Well, I think that speaks to a couple other issues that people have raised, you know, having uh, expertise, um, third party verifiers, um, folks who are involved in project development and, and market, getting projects to market who are quote unquote unbiased. And how do you, when you're thinking about a project, how do you think of the order of magnitude when you're thinking about your budget and all the overhead costs that go into it um, before you, you realize you have a viable project? And then where can you get funding for that if you're not yet getting paid for those offsets? Sure, sure. I'll jump in on that one as well. So the, the, um, the, the typical practice for identifying a project activity is to run a feasibility study with a group that is familiar with uh, protocols and the process flow. Um, certainly we do that in-house. Um, and then from there, you're looking at just like anything, what's the cost benefit analysis? What are my CapEx? What is my OpEx? Uh, and, and seeing what the market value of those credits will be. Uh, and then there's different structures out there for funding, which can include offtake of credits. So what they call prepay or unit contingent contracts upon delivery that can help you get funding from banks or what have you. Um, but that, that's all um, part of the um, kind of the, the different practitioners in offset world. Um, and that's, you know, just to be completely frank, what we do, so. Great, thank you. Um, we have one participant who's been patiently waiting, uh, who raised their hand. Uh, Laurel Barton, I'll allow you to talk. I don't think I raised my hand on purpose. I'm sorry. I'm just listening. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right then. Um, we have a question. Um, the question was, can banking offsets lead to market manipulation? So can people buy offsets, not retire them, and essentially manipulate market prices? Um, so no, I mean, the, the offsets, you know, if you look at cap and trade programs across the world, you know, the idea of cap and trade and offsets is that it's a fungible product. It becomes a commodity or credit that's memorialized and minted. Um, the, um, you know, if you're, if you're talking about any kind of hoarding or what have you, um, I mean, that exists potentially in any market, right? Um, I haven't seen that today. And I would say that um, generating offsets and not monetizing them or holding them and buying them, um, you know, is, is um, you know, there's, there's market risk with that. Right, you could hold an offset. You could bank a credit, and you know, just like any traditional commodity market, that market could go down. Now we haven't seen that for years because it's been, you know, oversupplied, and but we've had demand really hit hard and um, create uh, incentive for new supply, and pricing has gone up. But eventually, that'll settle out. Um, so, like any market, they'll have risk for banking. Thank you, John. Uh, one other hand raised. I'd like to call on Aisha. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I don't know exactly who should answer this question. Probably a mix of you, but Michael first came to mind. So we, uh, I'm up here in Humboldt County, um, and we are in the process of finalizing our multi-jurisdictional um, <clears throat> climate action plan. And we have a lot of redwood trees up here. A lot of it is already being um, claimed. Uh, as, as carbon offsets by private landowners. However, there are some lands, um, both you know, forest lands and other natural and working lands that have potential. Um, and the jurisdictions naturally want to eventually be able to count those sequestration projects um, or the sequestration potential towards uh, their GHG reduction goals. 
our understanding, and this is kind of where I'm wondering if our understanding is correct, is that in order to actually count those projects towards GHG reduction goals, um, you have to a you know have them uh, designated as a project that that goes through the registry process um, and and then can generate offsets. Um, then the other bit is that we would actually need to conduct an inventory so then over time we could have a good idea of what the um, reductions actually are rather than just let's let's figure out the potential and then we'll just um, count it towards the goals without having a baseline. Um, so just curious if any of you are able to speak to that or if I'm getting any of that wrong. Um, I know it's a pretty beefy question, but you all seem like amazing experts. So I, I wanted to throw the question out there. I'll start with the climate action planning perspective, which is probably the least technical and administrative of all of them. Um, part of that is those trees were there in your existing conditions. So hopefully you've counted them as, as part of your assets, if you will. And in the baseline inventory actually showed the sequestration that, that is occurring with those. If you haven't, then that is a potential for additional uh, reductions. It sounds great that you have an active and healthy redwood forest. Uh, what I was speaking to during, uh, on the climate action planning side was areas that uh, may not have enough uh, tree canopy cover and, and suffer from a heat island effect. I don't think that's your problem. Also, uh, a good thing about this is that it sounds like these are natural redwood trees. You're not irrigating or in, in any way assisting in them. So there's actually real uh, sequestration potential. Getting into um, how you would calculate it, yeah, you would have to uh, verify the, the sequestration, not just figure out the potential, but also uh, verify that. And I'll let John or some others get into the details of that. I was going to give someone else a chance to respond, but uh, yeah, in, in general, <clears throat> there are foresters and auditors out there that can verify credits either via offsets, uh, the registered offsets that we talked about, or even just doing greenhouse gas inventory or sequestration analysis. Um, and that's really in the realm of, of the forestry uh, sector, uh, and there's groups out there that can do that. I think yeah, we have time for, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead, next one. I'll say, I think we have time for a few more questions and we're likely not gonna get to all of them, but um, what is the present feasibility of mechanical removal? Uh, as already mentioned, uh, direct air capture. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's not widely sure. used um, at, at present. I've seen quotes in the, in the few recent years that running about 500 to $600 a ton but uh, th those are often quotes from people who are project proponents. So it's not widely used uh, at, at present. Um, you know, it, just to use that, to take that number as, as a real number, uh, that you could compare that to what John presented in terms of current prices in the market, whether it's in Europe or, or the US and, and whether it's on the voluntary or the compliance market where you're anywhere from, let's say $6 to $70 uh, a ton. So right now it's not it's not economically uh, feasible. It just doesn't compete in the market. Um, so it, and I've heard claims that that with technology development they might get that down to hundred dollars a ton. Then then you know if they if that if they are successful in that that could become competitive. But one would think that you would want to from an efficiency point of view would you want to go through all the things first that are less uh, costly and, and that have already been shown to uh, be more uh, efficient at this point. But if we sucked up all the other ones and then we're left with that, well, then may maybe maybe that will go. John, do you want to add anything? You, you probably touched on yeah, this. Yeah, so, so exactly right. It's very nascent technology. There's a lot of an interest in investing in it. Um, it's low yield uh, for the dollar per ton co marginal cost. So you know, the Rich gave some numbers there. Um, you know, very high cost. There is one that exists today in, in the U.S. that's participating in the LCFS market, which is a much higher price compliance market um, that's also being supported by United. 
Um, but it is very, very nascent, very fledgling technology. There's a lot of interest to bring it on, um, but um, uh, not quite there yet. And not to be confused with carbon capture and storage, which right. there is a lot of interest in doing that. It's not the same thing that is avoidance and, and sequestration and um, uh, you know uh, just, uh, putting into the ground into geological formations. Um, that is certainly a lot of interest in being incentivized by the federal government um, and offsets. Great, I'm gonna th go, go ahead. I'm gonna move on to one last question, which kind of gets at a few questions I think from several people in terms of natural uh, landscape or natural land management or regenerative agriculture, um, as been mentioned, land stewardship. Uh, we have some folks uh, who are talking about. Um, taking row crops out of production, planting trees, or doing something on rangelands. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how those kinds of projects uh, can be viable? Yeah, so it's, it's um, you're, the regenerative ag is, is really was all the craze um, a couple years ago, and it's continued to be a, of interest. Given the you know, wide uh, the number of acres that we have in the U.S., North America, really in general, um, where you can implement practices, everything from no-till to uh, you know, uh, grazing grazing practices to uh, fertilizer amendments, um, and and to be able to monitor that effectively with protocols that are currently being reviewed and and going through uh, adoption process, uh, both on Barrier and Climate Action Reserve. So yes, they are viable. There are groups that are generating volumes. Um, they, it is the, the name of the game there really is scale, aggregation, uh, and then those credits typically do sell at a premium to other offset projects to, to cover the marginal costs and to, to realize a profit margin. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, I hope everyone here on the call uh, got something out of it, uh, but there definitely is more ahead of us in this series as we uh, move on into next week's uh, session, which will be on Wednesday, um, focusing on the supply side considerations. So getting a little bit deeper into some of the questions that were posed here, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, an actual carbon registry um, <coughs> representative from the Climate Action Reserve, We'll also be hearing from uh, another registry called NORI, uh, which works specifically um, in the voluntary markets, market space and, re and regenerative agriculture um, offsets. And then we'll also be hearing from an organization called Climate Trust, um, which can be considered a, a project developer. So someone who can help uh, uh, provide the technical assistance in facilitating your carbon offset project and getting it to market. Um, Please stay tuned for the, for the next sessions. And again, we'll be following up with uh, making available the recordings, the slides, uh, questions with responses. Um, and you can find that all at uh, centralcoastclimate.org slash sequestration, uh, which we will also put in the chat and follow up with everybody um, following this presentation. So wanna thank everyone for making the time today, this afternoon to participate and we look forward to engaging with you in the following weeks. Thank you.